Well, welcome everybody to this panel discussion. Thank you very much to the conference organizers and all the participants for joining us. I think we've got a great discussion planned for you today on policy and transformation and virtual care and how these things have been uh, evolving uh, since the pandemic and continuing to do so as we continue to work through the pandemic and um, new policies coming up and questions of which policies uh, that and changes that did take place ought to be changed, uh, which ones sort of uh, ought to remain, uh, which ones still need more information. And so we hope that this um, discussion will help to inform some of that. Uh, what we're going to do as far as the format is uh, have a couple of quick uh, self-introductions for folks. Um, then we'll go into some questions and we'll have some closing remarks towards the end. So um, just real quick for myself, I'm Dennis Chorninke, I'm a former White House uh, Presidential Innovation Fellow, um, worked across uh, this current administration and the previous administration with pandemic response, uh, primarily on uh, issues of telehealth and AI modeling. Uh, and um, uh, more broadly, um, I'm a healthcare executive uh, with uh, over 20 years kind of working in the areas of finance, healthcare, uh, and technology. Uh, so we'll start uh, with uh, with Jody Daniel. If you can give us a quick uh, introduction and some opening remarks, uh, we would greatly appreciate that. Great. Thank you so much, Dennis. Um, and thank you for the conference organizers. I'm very glad to be here today and to be on this panel. My name is Jody Daniel. I have been working in healthcare for over 30 years and have always been engaged on some of these cutting edge issues and how innovation um, and changes in technology, policy, uh, reimbursement really impact health and health outcomes. Um, currently, I'm a partner at Kroll & Mooring. I founded and lead our digital health practice here. Um, we are advising traditional healthcare players like healthcare providers and health plans on how to bring innovation into practice and also advising technology companies that are, are innovating and trying to bring that innovation to help improve healthcare and healthcare delivery and trying to figure out how to navigate those regulatory challenges along the way. Um, before coming to Quill and Mooring, I worked at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services for much of my career. Uh, initially, I came to HHS to help draft the original HIPAA privacy rules under the Clinton administration. Um, I was the first senior counsel for health IT, um, actually under Alex Azar when he was the general counsel, and then um, helped found the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT um, and served as the founding director of policy there. Um, while there, I was responsible for regulations regarding standards and certification for health IT, working with, meaningful, uh, with CMS on the Meaningful Use Program, FDA on safety and oversight, uh, telehealth issues, um, consumer health issues, sort of the whole gamut, um, and now bring some of that insight to um, the ground where folks are trying to figure out how to bring that innovation into practice. Um, you know, just a, a, one, just some short opening remarks. Um, I think we really uh, saw a huge spike in the use of digital health and um, virtual care technologies um, because of the pandemic. Um, in some cases, we saw um, we saw companies that had a plan to transition over to um, more telehealth, and they had a three-year plan, and they had a um, change that plan to like a three-week plan um, and implement telehealth capabilities and telehealth services really overnight. Um, we saw policies that had really been blocking the ability to implement widespread virtual care and telehealth um, disappear overnight with a lot of waivers at the state level and at the federal level. And we saw consumers, patients, and healthcare providers really adopt and embrace this technology um, overnight, again, overcoming a lot of those cultural barriers um, and getting a lot more experience in how virtual care and telehealth can really be a part of the solution to providing healthcare services uh, to patients. Um, I, you know, we'll talk a lot more today, but I think one of the you know, one of the good things that came out of the pandemic is that we really were able to embrace the technology and switch over quickly. Um, I think there's a long way to go. Um, and I have some concerns about what will happen when the pandemic ends and some of those waivers um, go away. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to move the regulations in a direction that supports that innovation uh, going forward. Wonderful, thank you. Um... Uh, Dr. David Randall. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, my name is Dave Randall. I'm the executive director and resident scholar with the American Research and Policy Institute in Washington. The organization is 
uh, in essence, an academic think tank with our focus on health policy, obviously, health information technology, and the study of principally entitlement systems, um, most notably Medicaid. So most of my peer reviewed research, published research has been in and around those genres. Um, I would also note that I am also a strategic advisor and advisory board member to the Self Care Foundation, a blockchain healthcare uh, company organization, which recently launched in July of this year, their global telehealth exchange. So I have some perspective in terms of how uh, and in what manner a telehealth exchange can function to serve beneficiaries that coupled with blockchain technology. So I look forward to the panel and uh, having a robust discussion. Wonderful, thank you. Well, we're all very privileged to have such accomplished and uh, thoughtful and well-researched uh, uh, perspectives and panelists with us today. Um, might start with um, with a question for you, uh, Jody. Um, I wonder if you can uh, start us off by discussing the importance and impact um, of, of policy around uh, privacy, uh, interoperability, and kind of general access to health data and how that can support the broader healthcare transformation. Yeah, sure. That it's a great question. Um, you know, in healthcare, there's really this growing um, focus on promoting access to health to data in order to enable data to follow the patient, to improve care coordination, to improve outcomes. Um, and there have been some significant policy changes to support interoperability and um, access to health data. It's interesting because it's happening at the same time as there's growing skepticism about uh, the use of data by technology companies broadly and more concerns about protecting privacy with regard to the data held by tech companies. So we have this kind of interesting dichotomy going on between what's happening in healthcare and, trying, and the promotion of health data and data access and the concerns about technology companies accessing data um, for other purposes that may be um, uh, inconsist inconsistent with expectations. So in 2020, there were new regulations that came out on interoperability from HHS. So um, the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, my old office, put out uh, regulations promoting interoperability and um, pre preventing um, or uh, creating a um, prohibition on information blocking, on actions that might limit the availability of health information. At the same time, CMS came out with rules that require plans to make patient data available um, through third-party apps that the patient may have um, to access that data. Um, so these new prohibitions and requirements are really interesting because we came from an era of HIPAA and privacy of data, um, and we have this backdrop of technology protections, uh, of protection of data by technology companies. And here in healthcare, some of our most sensitive data, we're seeing this shift toward promoting access to data, which is something that I think can be really helpful as we're talking about innovation in healthcare, use of new digital technologies, use of virtual care technologies and the like, and can really spark innovation in that space. Um, so while these policies are um, interesting, somewhat controversial, they really do help enable innovation in healthcare in some of the areas that we care about. Um, we are also simultaneously seeing some changes on those privacy policies. So we've seen proposed changes on HIPAA um, to relax some of the requirements in order to support care coordination. There are proposed rules that we uh, that uh, HHS has put out. We're seeing um, some relaxation of uh, heightened requirements for protection of substance use disorder information um, that have been around for some time. Um, and then we're seeing concerns about, again, how these tech companies outside of the healthcare space might use that data in ways that um, may not be um, consistent with the rest of the health system. So um, as we're enabling more access to data by third-party apps, by technology companies that might not be subject to HIPAA, there are growing concerns about um, what they might do with that data and how that data might be used. And just uh, recently, we saw the Federal Trade Commission come out with a statement that they're trying to figure out how to leverage their authority 
to, um, to enforce against mobile health apps that might be using data in ways that are not authorized by the individual. So there's um, some interesting changes. I do think that they overall are good for patient care, for care coordination, and can really help with innovation. Um, and you know, some of these are still to come and we'll see how the agencies enforce the rules and what regulations and changes come out uh, with regard to the privacy proposals that we've seen uh, this past year. Yeah, those are really great points. Um, and I think, you know, the point about the challenge of striking a balance between, you know, making data accessible, but also making sure that it doesn't get um, uh, abused, that access doesn't get abused by perhaps overzealous technology companies, which uh, we have not always seen be the best uh, self-regulators, un unfortunately. Um, I think changes to uh, the proposed changes to the HIPAA privacy rule uh, make a lot of sense generally because I think, and you probably know more about this, but kind of from a legal perspective, um, it, the, the, the range of sort of data sharing use cases uh, typically requires some sort of standard that has to be met as far as the circumstance prior to a provider, um, you know, or, or uh, any kind of health data uh, steward. Uh, the, the certain standards have to be met, but these proposed rules, I think, kind of lower some of those standards to uh, essentially you know, more kind of, I think much more uh, reasonable parameters, uh, whereas I think previously they were quite prohibitive. So I, I think overall, you know, it's it's a move in the right direction. And I think as we know originally, you know, the, the HIPAA rules were designed to help create a framework for data sharing, but of course it ended up being used by uh, folks in your profession to uh, signal risk and <laughs> be used as a, as a reason not to share in, in many cases, unfortunately, but, uh, I'm, I'm glad we're we're finally moving there, and uh, perhaps you know the pandemic has has helped to push us in that direction um, uh, towards having I think a more kind of robust discussion about you know where this balance really needs to be, and that we've really been kind of on the wrong side of it with things being too prohibitive uh, previously, and that's been harming patients. Um, uh, Dave, do you have any uh, thoughts uh, on on this particular issue? No, certainly. Add anything? No, I, I I do actually. So you I I think. Uh, you touched on a very important point, that being interoperability. And that's where I think new innovation in terms of, of specifically the use of the blockchain can really help in terms of dealing with issues that are known all too well, as an example, at DOD and the VA, in terms of their build out and interoperability issues that have been well documented by the GAO in terms of the uh, lack of ability to access key data points. The blockchain in terms of having a permission-based system um, and a system that allows individuals or for providers to access uh, data and or information by permission, which is uh, somewhat lacking in my opinion within siloed data systems can really um, go a long way in terms of dealing with many of the issues that we're certainly all uh, aware of at this point in time. Yeah, thank you. Um, so let me maybe um, direct the next question to you and um, maybe switch gears just a, a little bit here, kind of from a, a little bit away from the data side that we can certainly come back to that um, to kind of a bigger picture around value and risk. Um, uh, Dave, do you see us uh, heading, uh, particularly as a result of, I think, recent changes, um, much more towards capitated risk models? Uh, absolutely. Um, I, I think how I'd like to answer that question is to take just a minute or two and talk about the impairment that occurred with the healthcare system and specifically with primary care providers, not only in the US, but around the world in terms of how the pandemic really dramatically impaired their ability to um, see patients. So you had doctors everywhere that had, you know, core issues, no patients, no revenue, and no way to get paid quickly. So telehealth in terms of the rules and regulation the Trump administration put forward and 
The Biden administration certainly has done that as well, have addressed those issues to a large degree. Um, physicians, needless to say, numerous studies have come out saying obviously they're getting paid less in this environment. So I think that you will see a pushback among providers. I think we're already starting to see it in my opinion that a capitated uh, risk model um, uh, in terms of how these physicians in particular will be paid for consultations, I think uh, will be standard um, with uh, appropriate rewards in terms of payment methodologies that will be forthcoming. Um, I don't think insurers um, will be able to um, continue paying providers less than they would be making in a in-person setting. Um, that's not good for the system. And frankly, I think you'll have physicians start to revolt. Um, obviously, some of the key items that telehealth has attempted to fix as a result of the pandemic is, is it's dealt with the core issues to a certain extent of patients uh, delaying essential care um, and lack of access to transportation in many cases, especially with vulnerable populations. And that's where I think telehealth solutions can and have made a difference by addressing some of these core issues. So in short, yes, I think a, a more robust capitated payment structure reimbursement methodology is coming, um, not only in the, in the US, but I think around the globe in terms of attempting to deal with the dislocation that occurred as a result of the pandemic. Yeah, I think these pressures have really helped to make clear um, the need for, for models like this and more innovative models going forward as well. Uh, Jody, did you have anything to add? Well, I was just going to say, I think also we're seeing more and more um, uh, uh, uptick of um, sort of risk-based payment models generally um, and folks embracing those and taking on some risk for health and health outcomes. Um, the other thing I just wanted to highlight is that we are seeing um, more debates about coverage for telehealth and virtual care services at the state level. Um, some states do require, um, you know, coverage parity and reimbursement parity. Some don't. It's a very controversial question um, about how um, how insurers pay for um, virtual care. I don't, you know, I I. I've been in a couple of these discussions and there's lots of different views on both sides of the issues about um, where there should be um, reimbursement parity and where there are services that may be better provided in person. Um, I think as we talk more about uh, racial equity and health equity, um, I do think that value, um, I'm sorry, uh, virtual care and telehealth services really add a lot of value and a lot to that discussion. That was going to be my next able... question too, actually. Ah, okay, on, go ahead. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so yeah, actually, you know, looking at this um, from kind of a broader, um, you know, sort of national policy perspective, um, you know, federal government that um, has been focused on trying to tackle and um, you know issues um, regarding uh, social equity and uh, better support and access uh, for underserved communities. Uh, HHS uh, is also getting focused on health equity, as I think are a lot of um, major market participants. Uh, thankfully, are focusing on these questions as well. I, I wonder if you can help discuss, um, you know, how policy and practice is, is changing, um, perhaps in some more detail to, to try to meet these goals? Yeah, uh, happy to. I, I'm, I'm actually really excited to see the, the significant interest in health equity and um, focus on, um, on how social determinants of health really impact health and healthcare and paying more attention to the social determinants of health 
in the delivery of healthcare. Um, you know, we're seeing changes at the public level where there's greater support for um, Medicare Advantage organizations to cover social determinants of health, social services um, in delivering care. Again, we're seeing because of uh, some of these uh, uh, risk-based models, we're seeing more uh, interest in pr providing um, uh, social services for patients as part of the solution to um, increase and improve health outcomes. Um, and the private sector, we're also seeing an explosion of resources um, and technologies to support better coordination between healthcare providers and social service providers. Um, you know, just one example we're seeing um, in the SDOH space, there are new networks and technology to enable healthcare providers to make referrals to social service organizations, companies like Unite Us, um, who is doing that in, uh, across the country, um, and, and to enable also better coordination between those healthcare providers and social service providers to make sure that the health needs and the social needs are um, addressed in parallel. Um, you know, for, I, I was just saying for telehealth and virtual care, I think it really does provide um, greater ability to access patients where they are, um, which can be really important when you're talking about um, some of the um, health inequities um, and ability to access care, providing virtual options or digital therapeutics or other kinds of innovations can really um, help reach different people where they are. Um, and meet those health needs. So I, I, I see, um, I see the, the shift uh, um, really positive and the focus on um, health equity and virtual care coming together in a way that I think really can, um, where, where one can help support the other, the goals of the other. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, you're certainly seeing uh, this innovation uh, in the states, specifically with state Medicaid systems, some have adopted virtual care uh, platforms more than others. Um, obviously, it is a challenge with vulnerable uh, 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 populations that don't have access to digital tools or, for that matter, um, connectivity to um, engage in virtual visits. So states are, are continuing to experiment in terms of ways to digitally deliver services where appropriate for these populations. So I think you're gonna see uh, an increased use of telehealth services specifically with state Medicaid systems. And obviously we're seeing more and more with Medicare as well, but I think just like Medicaid is a state federal partnership with states doing sort of their own thing in their own backyards, I think you're going to continue to see divergence and to a certain degree innovation in terms of how delivery systems will function in the future using um, digital services like uh, telehealth. If, if I can respond to one thing, um, I agree 100%. I, I was just saying that one of the comments you made about the, the digital divide and reaching, um, providing telehealth and virtual care services to individuals who may not have the technology for virtual visits, um, I think sort of underscores the importance on flexibility in how, you know, how either the state laws or Medicare defines what is um, an appropriate service that can be reimbursed in order to enable yes. flexibility to support reaching um, some of the most vulnerable in our in our society with the right services. Yeah, and just, you know, just as a quick example on that, um, with with telehealth, we, we know um, I think we have a lot of good data that shows uh, when it comes to the question of no shows um, that uh, more disadvantaged populations are more likely to kind of have more no-shows, uh, you know, when they're making appointments and not able to show up for a whole host of different reasons, um, you know, things in their lives getting in the way, the, the complications of getting to, um, you know, getting to the clinic in person, uh, especially, you know, during work hours and things like that. Um, we also have good data as potentially a solution to that, that uh, telehealth has uh, can have a significant impact on reducing no-shows by, of course, making it easier to uh, meet those appointments or 
uh, to more conveniently reschedule them, um, you know, with better kind of digital sch scheduling platforms. But as um, you know, as David mentioned, uh, these are also the populations that are often less likely to have um, access to some of the technological resources necessary to be able to comfortably do um, virtual visits. So just my personal opinion is that I think we should see more public spending in um, allocating resources towards developing that infrastructure, uh, specifically for underserved communities. So. Um, so I, I like this discussion and, and I think it ties in nicely with, uh, you know, what telehealth can do and, and ways that policy can help um, support that. So um, maybe more broadly, um, but, but within this theme also a question for both of you, you know, what do you think um, ought to be the role of innovation in our current policy environment? What can policy do to help uh, support, you know, innovation and specifically kind of in what directions uh, in order to help um, keep making these kinds of technologies more available, you know, not only just for improving our healthcare system in general, but also, um, I'd say, towards making it more resilient, um, you know, in light of the pressures we've seen from, um, you know, from a pandemic like COVID-19 and potentially repeats or something like that. I'll, I'll start if it's okay with, uh, with you, Jody. Right. <laughs> um, I, I think that in my opinion, and experience that one of the biggest impediments that I see in terms of innovation are the regulatory challenges associated with any new technology innovation and its, its scalability in terms of deployment, which certainly we've seen with the use of telehealth. Obviously, the federal government responded very quickly in terms of the waivers that were granted by CMS to allow for um, really very quick deployment of the service via Medicare. Um, the states weren't as quick in terms of rolling it out with, with their Medicaid populations. And obviously we have seen pushback by different provider communities in various states, specifically through state medical boards, without going into all the details in terms of specific state actions. A number have been really uh, resistant to using the technology for the sheer fear of what this is going to do to their revenue streams. So um, dealing with these regulatory hurdles, these entrenched interests that obviously have a financial interest at stake in terms of status quo reimbursement methodology, I think is perhaps one of the bigger challenges in the United States in terms of having more widespread adoption of technology platforms like this. But I think with anything, especially with uh, the, the behemoth that is the American healthcare system, Today, it, it, it will take time and it will be incremental, but I think in terms of where we are today versus where we were in January of last year is uh, a real leap forward in terms of being able to deploy and use technology that frankly has been around for uh, a lot longer. So I think that's, that's um, one of the biggest uh, impediments are these regulatory issues that we've touched on here today. I, I agree. Um, I, um, I, I see the same thing and, and just evidenced by how quickly we were able to switch over to using some of the virtual technologies that we have um, when the pandemic hit and when those waivers came in place. I think it's testament to that. Um, I also think just to build on that, the variability across states of the various different rules and requirements makes it really hard for a technology company or even a health system to scale the, um, the practice of telehealth because they, you know, having to understand not just how to navigate the federal requirements, but also each of the state requirements, I think really is challenging. Um, so, you know, I, I think, you know, the, this goes to reimbursement, coverage, licensure issues have been coming up for, I don't know, 15 years, at least that I've been seeing them um, on, on how, you know, when, when a healthcare provider that's used to seeing a patient in, you know, in Maryland where I live 
um, all of a sudden that individual during the pandemic decides to go to Florida to spend to, to stay with their parent because um, they're not working in the office anyway. And now that provider is practicing without a license because they want to maintain a relationship with that patient in Florida um, since they're not licensed in Florida. That's, you know, that is not supportive of virtual care and care coordination. And so I do think some of those regulatory hurdles are um, impediments to the expansion of telehealth and virtual care. You know, a couple of other things, I think that, you know, some of the, like, you know, I started with some of the privacy and data issues in, in this, um, but I do think um, having uh, policies that, that will apply across technologies, regardless of whether that technology is covered by HIPAA or not, um, I think is important so that there is consistent trust in how, how private patient data will and will not be used, I think is important. Um, I also think just having um, good tool, um, good um, oversight practices. So just how FDA is looking at some of these devices, I think can also be really helpful in promoting innovation. Um, I think they've done a lot to try to um, strike the balance between enabling innovative technologies to get to market and protecting consumers. But I think that's an, another important um, policy that needs to be, uh, that needs to continue in order to enable innovation. Yeah, we're seeing some interesting frameworks developing at the FDI, F, uh, FDA for, um, you know, categories of kind of ML uh, AI driven devices and software as a device and things like that. So I think that's all moving in the right direction. Um, but yeah, I couldn't agree more. There's just so many challenges with uh, regulation, kind of federal, state level licensing, all these things that uh, I think so many of us have kind of been um uh, you know, fighting about for, for, for years, trying to get more policymakers uh, and folks to, you know, be more willing to start changing the status quo. Um, we're pretty much at the end of our time. Um, I'd like um, to have maybe each of you just give us a quick, um, you know, minute or so of, um, you know, your closing thoughts and, um, you know, recommendations, questions, whatever you want, you know, our participants to keep in mind as, as, they, uh, as they walk away from the panel. Uh, so maybe David, if you want to go first. Sure, sure. So certainly the pandemic has um, really shifted the technology landscape, specifically within telehealth because of the obvious impairment that we saw in the marketplace in terms of doctors not being able to see patients and obviously impairing their revenue and telehealth exchanges, telehealth applications were able to bridge the gap, so to speak, during this period of time. Needless to say, I think it's here to stay. I think we'll have a lull here, but I think it's going to continue to grow um, as demographic shifts uh, forward um, with more and more individuals and patients becoming a lot more comfortable with technology platforms that enable them to do it. I think uh, it's, it's, it's helped to um, indoctrinate the population that, you know, it's probably easier to use your phone or computer to get the basic things you need than rather getting in your car or bus or train to go see your doctor and it's far more efficient as well. Now, obviously, as I mentioned, there will be regulatory challenges, reimbursement issues with providers that will continue to crop up. But I think uh, in the long run, um, the technology will help to sort that out. And I think it will continue to evolve and innovate. Yeah, thank so, you, I agree. Jody? I, I would just say, I'm, I'm actually excited for the future um, in, in virtual care and use of innovative technology in healthcare. I feel like we have really um, gotten over a hurdle um, in the last couple of years. Um, I, I still think there are regulatory challenges. Um, I, I think that some of those will, uh, will kind of resolve themselves uh, in the wake of the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic, hopefully. Um, but I, I also think that there are ways around some of those regulatory challenges and really encourage folks that are trying to bring uh, this kind of innovation into healthcare practice to, to spend the time to try to figure out how to do that because the benefit is great. 
Um, I also like to encourage folks, having been a former policymaker, um, generally folks at HHS want to do the right thing. They're really interested in promoting innovation in healthcare. Um, I, you can really help by providing data about the benefits of these kinds of technologies to give them support to advance the policy. Um, and also to come in and, and talk to them and give them some on the ground feedback um, so that they have that knowledge and wisdom that you possess as they're developing policies to make sure that those policies support the innovation of tomorrow, not just the innovation of today. Yeah, couldn't agree more. That's great advice uh, from both of you. Uh, thank you both very much uh, for uh, lending us your expertise on this panel. And uh, thank you to uh, all the participants again for joining us and the conference organizers. Uh, I am also excited uh, about the digital transformation of healthcare. Uh, it's still early stages, but finally feels like we're starting to get a little bit of traction. So uh, hopefully with uh, some of the things that we've discussed today, people will keep working on it. And things will, will keep getting better. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. <laughs>